perhaps we could get we could get started. Uh, we we have a, a somewhat lengthy program this evening. My name is Bob Newton. I'm the acting director of the church in the 21st Century Center. Um, we are the sponsor of this event with our co-sponsor, the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event, uh, everyone in the audience, and especially Sister Helen Prejean, uh, who was here in 2010, four years ago, and spoke in Conte Forum to a, a group of over 1,100 uh, individuals. We, th this uh, semester, the theme of the, of the church in the 21st century uh, is indicated in a magazine, which I hope all of you have had the opportunity to get a copy and to take a look through it. It's called, uh, it's titled, The Poor, What Did Jesus Preach and What Does the Church Teach? And this event, you know, dealing with a group in our society that are poor and marginalized it certainly fits into that theme. Um, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to watch uh, the movie uh, Dead Man Walking, which, believe it or not, was made 20 years ago, was released 20 years ago. Uh, but before we, we uh, view the movie, Sister Helen would like to make some introductory remarks to help us better understand uh, the film. After the film, uh, she will return again to the, to the podium. So let's welcome Sister Helen Prejean. Okay, this is gonna be short. Y'all all know, well, I'm from New Orleans, but y'all all know how Pope Francis is saying, go out to the margins, go out to the poor people. Well, this story, my story, is a story of my beginning to get it about the gospel, that I should be on the side of people who are marginated, and it's about my faith journey. And um, so you will notice that every character, which is based on real people, the death row inmate is on a faith journey, and what is the journey into the message of Jesus that everybody's on. And of course, you have people on the other side, too. So I'm glad to be here with you. Let's look at the film, and I'll talk to you afterwards. Let me just use this opportunity that also out there are the books of Dead Man Walking, my two books, and The Death of Innocence, about two innocent people that I accompanied. And uh, the books will be for sale. You get both for $25. I'll be glad to sign them for you. So I look forward to that, too. Well, where did it take you? Just a few things about the making of the film. I wrote uh, Dead Man Walking. The hardback came out in 93. It was just reissued, the 20 year anniversary of it. Uh, Susan read it in 1994 when the paperback came out and she's the one who's behind this film. And she pastored Tim for nine months till he finally broke down and read the book. And he read the book, and they saw that we needed to do a new kind of film on the death penalty in the United States. We'll talk about that, what you think that was. Uh, so I, can, I credit Susan with having the passion to see it. And what she said to me was, most of the films that have been done that have executions in them most of the energy of the film is all around, was the person innocent or guilty, then you find out they're guilty, so it ends with the execution and justice is done. So where did Tim Robbins and Susan, and I do the same in the book, where did it take you? Is it a pro-death penalty film? Is it an anti-death penalty film? And Tim said, there's a difference between art 
and propaganda? Is the film art, or do you think it's propaganda, trying to get you to look at one side and, and be swayed by it? So I realize it's kind of hard after the film to speak. The theater managers told Tim that after the film was shown in theaters, people just stayed seated and they filed out in silence because they were thinking, and that's what the film does. It brings you. Do you think it was fair? Do you think it brought you over to both sides of the suffering? So any questions you have or anything you'd like to say, I can talk to you about how the film was made, talk to you about that, talk to you about the victim's family, talk to you about the guards that have to do the killing, or any aspect of it that maybe you might want to go deeper into. So we have the mics, just come up to them. It's okay to stand in line. We don't have to wait until one person finishes. And either a comment you want to make or maybe a question. Hi, thank you very much for being here. Glad to be here. Okay. I'm wondering more about um, you know, your ability to feel compassion for Poncelet. Um, definitely wasn't easy. You know, for someone who you knew, or you came to know at the end, killed someone, but even if he didn't, he was involved in it. Uh, so I'm wondering, I know there's not an explanation for how you were able to feel compassion. It's not like some process you went through, but the, qu the, wor the best, worst, the worst, best way of asking is how were you able to feel compassion for it? And wasn't it kind of defeating almost? loving this guy who did that? Like, wasn't, were you submitting to something? Did you feel like, did you feel like you were being weak by doing it? Um, yeah. Okay, great. Boy, that's a good question. It's the heart of it, really. That's probably what I'm asked the most. How could you show compassion for someone, <coughs> who, excuse me, who had done something so unspeakable? My own journey in it, in, in which I take you through in the book. <coughs> um, it's the outrage and horror of what the, the six people I have accompanied to execution, four of them were guilty. Two of them, as I wrote about in Death, Venison's where I'm saying. And innocent people were brutally killed. And teenage kids in this instant, uh, old couple strangled and murdered in, in their apartment, another. And it's unspeakable. And I'm outraged over it. But when you are with a human being, human beings are more than the worst act of their lives. We cannot, like, be freeze-framed into the worst action. All he is is a murderer in cold blood. That's all he is. That's his essence. So the part of me that could feel for him was in the humanness, and, it was, and that is the dignity of all human beings, that as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says, that no matter what crime a person does, that we are worth more than that, and everyone deserves dignity. And that's what connected, uh, and that's what I felt for him, and for his mother, and for the victim's family. My image from the Christian, from the Christ perspective of this is that on one arm of the cross, you have the perpetrator who's done an unspeakable crime, which we are horrified at and outraged at, and then on the other arm are the victim's families that have been made to suffer. And so then we have to ask ourselves, what do the victims' families gain even when they get to watch the execution? Can it heal them? What does it do for them, this justice they're given? And that's where the movie takes you to those questions. Myself, personally, I made the journey over to both sides. With the victims' families, I found out when I would go to the support groups that most of them said, everybody leaves us alone because they don't know what to do with our pain. 
and that they shouldn't be left alone. So I was brought into it, and I tried to accompany both. Did you want to respond? No, that, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody else? Sister Helen, um, so obviously, like you just said, we have the victims on the one hand and the perpetrator on the other. And I think many people think that you're either one side or the other. How do we people see that middle ground, the middle ground of the gospel, um, where that justice really is? How do we have people see that and have that conversation? Mm -hmm. That is a conversation. And, you know, I go around the country to help the American people to dig deep into this. Most people don't reflect deeply on the death penalty. We're an activist community, and for, thank God, the death penalty doesn't touch most of us as a deeply personal moral issue because we don't have to deal with it. Most people don't. So the reflection's not deep. So what I do is not to go and make a speech and try to persuade people. You say you're Christian, this is what Jesus would want us to do and preach it, people. But simply what you do, and this is why Tim Robbins calls this art, because he takes you over to both sides of the suffering and just takes you there so that then you take it and reflect. Our culture says choose one side or the other. If you're against executions, then you must be against the victim's family. If you're for the victim's family, then you must be for the execution. As one of the victim's family said that I tell you in Debbie and Walking, Lloyd LeBlanc, he said, Sister, everybody was saying to me, Lloyd, they killed your son. You gotta be for the execution or it'll look like you didn't love your boy. This is the ultimate punishment. You had the ultimate loss. You're not going to go for the ultimate punishment. What's wrong with you? He said, people see forgiveness as weak. And the gospel of Jesus is, where is Jesus when Matthew Poncelet's executed? He's with everybody. Is he not? He's with the mama who's at home with her boys while their brother and her son's executed. He's with the victim's family who has lost their loved ones in the most terrible way. He's with the guards who are doing their job that night. I get to know them. I tell the story of one of them in Dead Man Walking, how he, after five executions, he couldn't do it anymore and he quit because he said they're defenseless. And you're taking a defenseless man, you're killing them. You're justified, you know it's legal, you know the Supreme Court said it's all right. But in my gut, he said, I know I'm helping to kill somebody who we've rendered defenses. And I know their crimes, because he was a supervisor on death row. He said, I know what every one of these guys did. Some of the murders they did are unspeakable. But then when you're close to it like that, and you gotta take somebody out of their cell and take them and kill them. And they tell us, you know, they have everybody meet with us. You're just doing your job. It's not. This is what the people want. Supreme Court said it's okay. They had a jury trial, the whole bit. But finally, it boils down to the fact that they're defenseless. And in this book, The Death of Innocence, I talk about a dialogue that I got to have with Pope John Paul. And that was my question to the Pope. And I said, does the Catholic Church only uphold the dignity of innocent life? And I get it about upholding the dignity of innocent life, unborn children, people with Alzheimer's. But when I'm walking with a man to execution, and, and the first one was Pat Sonier, and he's chained, and the guards are all around him. And he says, Sister, just pray God holds up my legs. And I said to the Pope, I said, Your Holiness, do we just uphold the dignity of the innocent? What about the guilty? And where is the dignity in this death? Do we have to execute him? And where, when you render someone defenseless and take them out and kill them, where's the dignity in that? And that was a question. And the response, Pope John Paul actually changed the Catholic catechism and helped move us to be pro-life Catholics, not just for innocent life, 
But when he was in St. Louis, he said no to abortion, no to euthanasia, no to physician-assisted suicide, and no to the death penalty, which is cruel and unnecessary. And he said, even those among us who have done a terrible crime have a dignity that must not be taken from them. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states in Articles 3 and 5, the right to life. So does government ever have the right to decide that some of its citizens ought to die and say they're going to set up a process for determining who those people are? when you have another way of keeping society safe, which is what a life sentence without parole is. In Article 5, no one shall be subjected to cruel and degrading punishment or torture. Is the death penalty torture? And we move from hanging to electric chair, sometimes to firing squad, and we move to lethal injection because we said we're going to make it more humane. And the European country in Belgium that was supplying the drug we were using for executions found out that their drug was being used to kill people in the United States, and they cut off the drug. So now there's this mass experimentation going on. Maybe you've heard of botched executions, because they're just putting chemicals together and experimenting to see what it takes to kill a person. And that's where it is now in the United States those that have the death penalty. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody else? Yes. Hello, and thank you very much for this film. And I identify and appreciate Tim Robbins' comments about it being art because it embraces both sides. Mm -hmm. I'd like to comment that um, I've been, well, first I'll just make a comment that I'm, I'm a dedicated atheist who finds delight in reading about religious traditions around the world because of, of the humanity of it all. So I, we're here. Some of my best friends are atheists. Yeah, so I just want to say we're here too. It means and, you're and, against and, the and, theism and, of and, the and, day, and I think I am too, but please and, continue. And, and some of us love you. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but I wanted to say I've been, I've been wrestling with, a, with a, an international issue yeah. as we witness the... Uh, the attacks of ISIL or Daesh or whatever you wish to call them, the Islamic State, which I have trouble calling them that. Yeah. And in that we, in the call is to demonize them. Right. And I don't un and I don't underestimate and I'm no, you know, no Pollyanna about how vicious and, and horrible they are, but they are human beings. Yes. And I have trouble, you know, as we say that people aren't touched by it, but we're all touched by it. It could be if I was younger, I might be volunteering for the military. We all have children who may be in the future. And I was listening to the uh, British commentary. Some are, some are disillusioned. They wish they could come home. Yeah. And, and the uh, British governments, as probably many other governments would be, that <coughs> we can't trust you. You can't come home. Given them the only option of continuing to fight for ISIL and probably being sent on a suicide mission to prove their worth. Mm. And I'm thinking, like, there's got to be a third way. Mm. There has to be a third way, whether arranging with Qatar or who knows where. That yes, you can. You be in detention. We can't trust you, but we don't have to condemn you to. Yeah. One, that it's one side or the other. Yeah. Thank you. In this book, I quote Albert Camus, who was a, a known agnostic. I don't know if he called himself an atheist, but he couldn't get himself ever to embrace what we call Christianity or any religion. And, uh, and he spoke out for human rights. He wrote a book, Reflections on the Guillotine in France, in 1957, that helped change the death penalty debate in France. And what I, I didn't know anything. You see this person in over her head, which is why Susan Sarandon wanted to take the role, because she likes to take the role of women who never end up as victims, but definitely get in over their head. They had Thelma and Louise on the other night on uh, TV. Uh, but learn along the way. And so I'm learning everything as I'm going along, because I don't know anything, and I make mistakes at first, not reaching out to the victim's family. But what I have learned is that the death penalty really epitomizes just what you were saying 
And, and you heard Robert Prosky, the lawyer for Robert Willie at the pardon board hearing say, it's easy to kill a monster, but it's hard to kill a human being. And so with the death penalty, we say this is the worst of the worst, and we have to execute these people in order for us to be able to live as a society. 9-11 happens, we say the terrorist or the enemy, the demon. You have to dehumanize people in order to kill them. And it's what sets the military in motion. Who's the enemy? Let's go kill the enemy so we can be safe. And you see that operating. I see it operating. I recognize the pattern of it now. Because if you recognize that this is a human being who has a mama and who has little brothers uh, and has a family, it's going to be really hard to kill a person. And one of the reasons I believe that we're still killing people in the United States is because the death penalty is a secret ritual. There have been three court cases to make executions public, and they've all been defeated. And it's what led me to write the book and get on the road to go speak to the people, to tell the story, to bring them close. Because I know the people are never going to get close to this so-called solution we have of how we're going to deal with terrible criminals. So what are we doing? I've found it such a deep, deep instinct in our country to send in the Marines or try to use military solutions for social problems. The death penalty is a form of military solution. We're going to use violence to kill the enemy in order to try to teach our children and to try to say that's the only way that we can solve our social problems. So what are we doing now? I don't know. I don't know how good it is for now the Americans and calling in other allies to go and be bombing people and it's a mess. I was with a woman from CNN who had been embedded over in Iraq and Afghanistan and she said what happened is that after World War I, we, the, the victors, drew lines around what had been the Ottoman Empire and just said, drew a line and said, this will be Iraq, this over here is going to be Pakistan, this is going to be Afghanistan. And we drew these lines as colonial powers. And the tribes are the ones that are going to have to deal with their land to get it back. And those lines now are becoming very, very porous. And now what are we doing? What's our role? I don't know. I'm not sure at all. And of the people I've known who've gone to Afghanistan and gone to Iraq, and this woman from CNN, Moni Basu, who had been embedded, just said, everybody's messed up. Because, you know, sometimes you're killing people and you think they're the enemy. They come in and they, they're going to explode, you know, an ID device or whatever, and you kill them and you find out it was just two teenagers on a motorcycle. Our, our people coming back, from Afghanistan and Iraq are terribly, terribly messed up. And uh, so I don't know, when are we going to go to another level? And I'm gonna tell you, our hope, I believe, more and more the young people in this country who are asking deeper questions. I think young people are helping us on a number of issues, are getting it a lot more about human rights, are getting it about the rights and human dignity of gay people and helping the whole country come along on that, that everybody has human rights and we have to treat people that way. So we're on our way. So you're at a prime time going to a really good, to use your in, intellects. And, and what does faith mean? I mean, it's great. One of the first people to stand up and say, look, I'm an atheist. The biggest rising number of people in, are the groups of people that call themselves none of the above in this country. What faith? What does Christianity stand for? What does it mean that chaplain, and this was real, in the book, the chaplain was actually worse than that guy. But what was his whole take on the death penalty and what the role was of, of me? What are you doing getting involved in this? A woman's never done this before. 
And the real chaplains at our prison in Louisiana tried to block all women from going to death row and be spiritual advisors after I was with this man, Patrick Sonia. And finally, we, I had to go to the warden, and we had to, you just have to say, they go, well, women can't handle this. You know, this is a man's thing. Got to do a man's thing. We need an experienced hand, the chaplain said, experienced hand. And his approach was simply give them the sacraments of the church, which is my job, and that's it. What's the role of love and forgiveness? Thank you, ma'am, for loving me. I never had love in my life. Is that part of a sacrament, too? Where does redemption come? How do we experience forgiveness? How do we know our worth when we've done something really bad? What does the message of Jesus have to do with any of that? But to use our minds to develop your intellect, to know what's going on in the world, to be able to use analysis. What, what does it mean to, to always be seeking military solutions to social problems? Can military solutions solve our social problems? Somebody else, yes. Um, have your feelings about this experience changed over time? They've deepened. One feeling that has changed over time is when I came out of the execution chamber, I, I vomited. I had never watched a protocol where a person was taken and killed. Uh, and I, my mission really was made clear to me then that night, standing outside the gates of Angola, that I've been a witness, so I gotta bring the message to the people, to bring them close so they can reflect. And I didn't, I, and I have to tell you that my hope has been strengthened. These 20 plus years going into civic groups and schools and churches and synagogues and all over the blooming place here. And that the people, when you bring people close, and it's what the film does too, they get it. It's not that people really do want to have the government killing people and believe that violence is a solution, but they don't have a way of getting close to the issue to really sort it out and see the alternative. So my feelings have deepened over the years of that education of the people through story. Story is the best way for us to go to both sides of an issue, more than preaching or just logical argument. Uh, and then I continue to accompany people on death row. And I'm with the third person now who's innocent. The thing is so broken. There are 144 wrongfully convicted people who've gotten off a of death row. Wrong person. Mistakes, most of it from prosecutorial misconduct. And my man on death row now that I'm accompanying is Manuel Ortiz. He's from El Salvador. He's totally innocent. We're just getting a new legal team. He was railroaded. There was a false witness put up against him. The defense said he had no way of being able to summon his own witnesses. There's no way that's a full and fair trial and due process of law and equal justice under law is done. It isn't. And he gives me courage because I keep visiting him and here's a man who's innocent and going on 23 years on Louisiana's death row. And, uh, and I always, when I leave that prison, I just go, it's a privilege to be able to accompany this person because he teaches me every time I'm with him. That keeps me going. And I do see we're beginning to shut the death penalty down. You know in Massachusetts, you, you were one vote away. Did you know that? It was like 1907 or 98, there'd been a terrible murder. A young, beautiful boy had been kidnapped and molested and murdered, and they brought it to the bank to bring the death penalty back to Massachusetts. And there was one man in your legislature who, when the vote came to him, and he said, I knew I had my hand on the needle, and he couldn't say yes, and it defeated it, and since then they haven't been able to bring it back. 32 states still have the death penalty. Every year another state does away with it. There are about four or five now poised to do away that executions are down. I was just in Texas, down from 48 
death sentences a year to two or three. The people in the pipeline, the people who've already been sentenced are being killed. Texas has killed 517 human beings. And we have a Supreme Court that supposedly has set up guidelines that the death penalty will not be arbitrary, capricious, or disproportionately meted out to poor people and minorities if they ever looked at the ground to see what was happening in the practice, actual practice, they would see that eight out of every 10 people chosen for death are there because they kill white people, and that when people of color are killed in this country, there's hardly a blip on the radar screen. They would see that only poor people are selected for death. They would see that their so-called guidelines aren't holding up, but they never look at the ground. And interesting, in our church, with the synod that's going on now, we starting to look at the ground. There were questionnaires in every diocese in the world asking the people, what's your experience of the family? What's your experience of contraception? What's your experience of divorce and remarriage? What's your experience of knowing gay people and their children? And the bubbles are coming up from the ground. And so when you look at the ground and the real life experience of people and listen to it, and then in the light of the gospel of Jesus, then make decisions and policies. That's when I believe you really grow, and that is what the church is about. That's what we got to be about. We're always growing on moral issues. We grew out of slavery, grew out of the uh, thought that because Eve had sinned in, in, in the garden that women couldn't be trusted to vote because, you know, women, you know, and then, you know, once a month they get flaky anyway, and they... They could be emotional and all this. We can't trust women with the vote. If you read the arguments that went on in this country about when women could vote, church wasn't always on that side of stuff. But we grow because we are the church and we grow in our experience. Yes, sir. I have a question about your uh, courage and strength. So you responded to this one-off letter, um, felt a calling. It, it, was, it was pushing you on the edges of your faith. Um, yet you got tested by more safer conservative faith practices like your mother at the table saying, why don't you just teach the kids and be a good nun? Or the parents, why didn't you call us and deal with us? We're the right, right side of the equation. And so I'm wondering, where did you draw the strength and courage to keep pushing on the edge of your faith and not go for the conservative way? Well, I made mistakes. That really helps teach you. I didn't know what to do with the victim's family, and I had stayed away from them. That was a bad mistake. And then the book, I tell you the, the heart of the story. You know the film has to be done in two hours, so Matthew Ponsolet is a composite character in it. But with the victim's families, then when I realized, one of the fathers said, why didn't you come to see us? And, I, and he, then he, in his graciousness, began to take me in, and I went to pray with him. Tim said, when we were doing the film, we're going to end this film with prayer. And I said, Tim, I believe in prayer, but how are people going to see what's going on if you just show us praying? And he said, now you the nun, and I'm the filmmaker. And I said, we can end this movie with prayer. I said, I'm all for prayer, but what will you see? He said, watch. You'll see. So that was with the victim's families. Then mama at the table, that question, honey, what has drawn you? These are the end of the line people? I mean, it's such a great question of a mama to a kid. Honey, go spend your time with the kids in St. Thomas. You can help them not go to prison and death row. And I have to tell you a little bit about what I learned about filmmaking and how you write a good script in films. I'm working with them on the text, uh, on the script. So when Mama asked a question, I had written in, well, Mama, this is what Jesus did. This is Jesus said to go with the marginated. I'm just trying to do what Jesus said. So Susan Sarandon looks at it and she goes, well, she said that kind of sounds like the company line. Like you to none, you're going to give the Jesus speech, right? 
And she crossed out my whole Jesus speech. And she said, how about this? And she wrote just a couple of words. Well, Mama, I feel more caught than drawn. He asked me to come. And so then the audience can come with me. And Tim Robbins said, the, a film begins to fail the minute the characters get to be predictable. Here comes the nun. She's going to give the Jesus speech. Yep, here it comes. <laughs> kind of like the old cowboy movies, the good guys in the white hats. You know they're not going to be killed at the end of the movie. You know they're going to be triumphant. So here's the nun. She gives the Jesus speech. And I feel more caught than drawn. And so it's like learning, being drawn into an experience and learning as you go. My faith has not been tested. Some people say to me, how can you believe in God when look at this terrible thing that's going on here? Doesn't it test your faith in God? And I go, this isn't God's problem. This is us. We the ones deciding we should kill each other. This isn't a Jesus thing. But the Bible Belt and the Death Belt are the same blooming belt in the United States. And the Bible quote, and it goes on around the death penalty, is something to see. And I have heard it all. Well, Jesus died on the, sins for, on the cross for our sins, so they dying on the cross for their sins, and that's how they get to heaven. Like God is pleased with sacrifice. God wants pain. God wants a life for life. That's who God is. And that's not the God Jesus taught us. And that's not why he died on the cross, as a sacrifice for our sins. That's a theology that came from St. Anselm in the 11th century. And he was the first one to give us a juridical model of the sacrifice on the cross. A divine being was offended. Someone had to make up to the divine being for the offense. Only the son could do it. So you sacrifice the son, and then that placates God, who had been offended by our sin. And that atonement theology, there's still a lot of people who think that, who misread the meaning of this cross. And this cross is like the six Jesuits that were killed in El Salvador because they stood in solidarity with the people. This cross is like Martin Luther King who was killed for leading us in a nonviolent civil revolution in this country. It's for those who are in solidarity with poor people and they share the fate. It's Oscar Romero, but never to placate a divine being who has been offended by our sin and to pay with our blood or to pay with our deaths. So there's a lot to think about in terms of our Christian faith and what the death penalty brings out. And if you want an easy, quick litmus test, what, what's your image of God, you look into the death penalty. Yes. Hi, thank you. I also appreciate your comments on what happened on the cross. Um, anyway, my question was about, uh, it doesn't, the movie doesn't, I haven't read the book, and the movie doesn't, really go much into what the role of the sacraments were in that last week. Um, so I'm curious to hear about that and what role the sacraments played. If the priest, the ones who were the priest on death row, I think if they had related in a personal way and shown personal compassion to the people on death row, I think they would have been glad to receive the sacraments. In fact, Pat Sonier did go to confession, and he did receive communion uh, as long as I was with him because the priest was doing it badly. He, he was an old guy. He should have retired. It was, like, bad. It, um, I mean, he was going up and down death row handing out modesty pamphlets about how to dress modestly in your cell. I mean... It, the men didn't feel they were very much in touch uh, with what they were going, going through. And so when, when compassion is there, then uh, Pat at the end just said, Sister Helen, you receive communion. He had already gone to confession and received communion. He didn't want to be near the, the, the priest. The priest had disrespected him. And uh, 
So see, sacraments are these signs that make God present and the grace in our lives. But if they're not done in love and in faithfulness to what the gospel is about, then they, they can't work magic in and of themselves. And, and the priest was saying to me, your job, plain and simple, is to get me in there to give the sacraments to them before they, before they die. That's their eternal salvation. And I believe in the sacraments. I believe the Eucharist, we need the Eucharist. We need all of the sacraments, I think. But if it's not accompanied by love and compassion, what does it mean? And it becomes an obstacle rather than uh, a, a means of making God present in our life. The real presence is us to each other in love, compassion, and honesty, see? For Matthew Ponsolet to take responsibility, to be authentic. What was his view of salvation? Jesus, good man, uh, what? went to heaven, praised, praised uh, Jesus, something like that. And I know Jesus paid for my sins on the cross. And, then, and so I'm saying to him, through Susan saying to him, well, it's not like you get a ticket to the circus and Jesus paid the price. You got to participate in your own redemption. And see, sacraments are a way to help us participate in the saving mystery of Christ in our own lives, to be forgiven day by day by day, and then also to be compassionate to others and to do justice in the world. Does that answer your question, or would you have a further one on that, on the sacraments? No, thank you. Um, no, it's just interesting to consider what, what role the, I guess the fact that um, even, I guess from my perspective, it seems like that grace is happening and God can use a priest even if the priest is not like quite in the right mindset. I don't yeah. know, does that seem true? Except when the personal relationship with someone who's going to be killed by the state is such that they do not feel or know that personal compassion from them, it's the personal does play a very prominent role. I mean, uh, so the worthiness of the priest, like when we go to celebrate Eucharist, is never the thing that determines whether Christ is present or not. But when you're talking about a one-on-one -on -one with people on death row and that personal presence and compassion is missing, and people who are on death row, 90% have already been, they were abused as children, they have not had healthy relationships, loving relationships. So it's very important that, that a priest is compassionate for people on death row, I believe, that because, is part of the sacrament. Because of the role that that compassion can play in helping the person to arrive at contrition? Or, Absolutely. Yeah. And then, if I may ask one other question. Sure. Um, what are you doing when you're watching an execution? What are you praying? Praying for them to be able to, that their passage will be one of going into love and mercy. I've accompanied them by then through the whole thing. That uh, conversation was with the second person in this book where he said, I hope my death gives them some peace. He was angry, this is Robert Lee Willie. Robert Lee Willie was a much tougher guy and I was only with him two months. And he was angry. He said, I got a thing or two to say to that victim's family. They coming to watch me die. They, they making statements to the press. They wish they could, you know, pull the switch. It was electrocution then. And it was a real tussle, because he couldn't get there. And I just, when he finally reached it, where he said, I hope my death gives them some peace. And then I said, that would be a great, thing to say to the parents, and he actually did it. And then seeing him be killed, he's rendered defenseless and he's killed, and I believe Christ is always going to be with the ones who are the victims. And at that point, he is that, and I pray for his safe passage over into the arms of God. I pray at the same time for the victims that he killed. I'm praying for everybody in there. 
when I'm in the execution chamber. For the parents that have been offered this, now you get to watch and this is gonna heal you and I know full well they're gonna go home and their chair is still gonna be empty where their loved ones sat. I'm praying for the warden, praying for the guards, praying for everybody. Thank you. Yes. Hello, sister. Maybe we'll take like one or two more. Uh, well, well, I'll try to give shorter answers. It's not your problem that it's going so long. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I had a question related to compassion and justice. And um, we saw a wonderful film, and I'm glad that Susan took your story and took it to the, um, to the movies. And we saw her portrayal of you. And my question is, how did you truly convey to these prisoners that you did not condone their actions, but that you did love them? And how did you convey that to the victims' families yourself? Yes. With the prisoners, it's, you did a terrible thing. You killed that innocent person. You know, that conversation. How do you think the parents feel? What if somebody killed your mama? How would you feel when they're having trouble getting there? Because see, when their own life is on the line and self-preservation kicks in, it can be hard for some people to feel compassion for the victim's family because they're coming after you and self-preservation, it's strong. With victims' families, what I did was start a group in New Orleans because I know they need, most of them were saying everybody stays away from us and we feel so alone. Nobody wants to hear our pain. They don't know what to do with our pain. So I did one concrete act there, and that is to start a murder victim support group. And the bishop in Lafayette, where the murders of the teenage kids happened, began that year to have a mass. The bishop himself celebrated Eucharist to gather victims of violence together. And then it was started in other dioceses too to have a healing service for people who have been violated, suffered violence, and I feel we need to do both. Thank you. Yes? Um, I wanted to thank you for sharing your experience because that's a gift to do. Um, but I also wanted to ask you, a lot of your work is surrounded by trauma. So how do you really cope with the trauma of the victims um, suffering through the murders and then the trauma of watching the death penalty occur? Well, my life isn't just trauma, there is that. But I belong to a really good sisterhood of love and support and a loving family. And I work with the human rights community with lawyers who are in there standing up for people that everybody else wants to kill. And that really encourages me, it strengthens me to do that. And I take time to pray to meditate, I feed off the scriptures, off the gospels, and to learn, to keep learning. And I have a really good faith community. I belong to St. Gabriel's. It's an African-American Roman Catholic parish. And African-American people have suffered through so much. And, uh, and then we all went through Katrina, eight feet of water, everybody's house, everybody lost their houses there. And so staying close to the faith community also helps me. I know that I don't comprehend a lot of it, that's just, but I just do my best and just try to keep learning and being faithful to what I know. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody else? Last one, I think, sister. All right. It's really a thrill. Um, you and Father Greg Boyle, I think, are... Um, probably my personal heroes so <laughs> and my kids from Australia who love you as well are sort of with me tonight so Thank we've you. seen that film. Did you mention Greg Boyle? Yeah. <laughs> Does everybody know who Greg Boyle is? Father Greg Boyle, um, Just Jobs Not Jails, Homeboy Industries LA. Yeah. Yeah working with he, he works with the gang members, helps them to become human beings, gives them another kind of family. Um, the last question answered a little bit of mine, but I was wondering about your own personal faith practice to really anchor you in Christ and how that gives you, I guess, joy, because I don't see a grind in you. Like, it's not sort of like, oh, I'm going to do this stuff, you know. Yeah. I'm doing a good thing. It's more 
there's a there's a lightness and a joy in you. So how do you sustain that in your own faith and what's your spiritual practice? Well, first of all, the waking up to faith in the gospel of Jesus that involved justice. I'm so glad to be awake and to be giving my life where I'm trying to work for something to help to transform society. And and when you read Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation. He talks about the joy of the gospel. And there is a joy in doing the gospel. It doesn't mean there are not tears and there's not great sadness. And people shouldering pain, these victims' families, more than I can even imagine. But what does St. Paul say? You know, dying and behold we live. And where sin abounded, grace more abounds. And grace carries us. Not ahead of time, but grace carries us. I experienced that, and I, uh, and I thank God for that. Thank you. Thank you. S Sister, we're going to take one more question and then close out the Then the jig's up. All right. One more. Last one. No pressure, but try to be profound, OK? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. I'll try to be quick. Um, when I was, uh, after finishing, you know, after the move finished, I was, I was, I remembered a speech by Robert Kennedy day after um, Martin Luther King, as you mentioned, which you mentioned, was yes. killed. Um, and it was about, about violence. And uh, at that time, it might have been only seen or mostly seen as violence towards, you know, unjust violence towards each other, racial violence, which was going on I mean, after Luther King died. But I think Robert Kennedy was against uh, that sentence, and he wrote it as a speech as against violence against, you know, as a whole. I'm, I'm going to read a few uh, lines. He said, well, violence is not the concern of any race. The victims of the violence are black and white, rich and poor, young and old famous and unknown. They are, most important of all, human beings whom other human beings loved and needed. And he goes on to say, what has violence ever accomplished? What has it ever created? No martyr's cause has ever been stilled by his assassin's bullet. No wrongs have been ever righted by riots and civil disorders. Um, he says, we must admit in ourselves that our own children's future cannot be built on the misfortunes of others. We must recognize that this short life can neither be ennobled or enriched by hatred or revenge. When I was, when I was uh, younger, I, 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 I debated myself, well, people in, in who have killed, they would deserve to be killed, but I, I realized that they, as human beings, have dignity. And, uh, and that killing them for, for killing would be more revenge than justice. Um, Good for you. Yeah, and uh, what, what is, uh, what do you think? You think violence breeds violence, like Robert Kennedy said. Absolutely, and yeah. I'll just, and I'll end it by talking about his daughter, Carrie, who was eight years old when her daddy was killed. And I heard her at the Martin Luther King Center in Atlanta. And she told the story of when she heard that her father had been assassinated, just as her uncle Jack had been. And she got in her bed that night, these are Carrie Kennedy's words, and she said, I knew what he had taught us. And I said to myself, whoever killed my father, I do not want to see the state kill them. That's an eight-year-old girl who grew up in the presence of that kind of father. And, and children learn, we get it from those that we are with. And she had that up from her father, and she's carried it. And it's how I came to meet her, how I came to work with her for human rights, uh, because she had been thrown in that fire as a young child. How does a child do that? How do any of us do that? How do these victims' families? I have met these human beings who have had their loved ones killed and they, 
They stand before us when New Jersey did away with the death penalty seven years ago. 62 murder victims' families testified saying, don't kill for us. And I'll leave you with this moral question. Maybe in some books of justice, when we hear of the terrible crimes people do to each other, we could say, those crimes say they deserve to die. But who deserves to kill them? Who deserves to kill them? I'll be very glad to sign these books for you. I want you to read these books. Thank you. Thank you.